Namaste. Hi. Meditation is probably the most challenging part. I could only speak from my personal experience. How samadhi happened to me? Back then, I didn't know about the energetic side of yoga at all. I was just enjoying it, and it's part of my job. Yeah. Most of my working career is about teaching people, helping people maintain their health and wellness. And part of it is teaching yoga. Although I was exposed to yoga at a young age and I was energetically sensitive, but I could not yeah, connect that to yoga at all yeah, until my energetic side opened up, reawakened, so to speak. It's already open, but back then it was a source of embarrassment. Because when you're so energetically open and you can't make anything out of it, yeah, and then your subtle entity is yeah, <laughs> open, mm -hmm. uh, manifesting, then, well, it, it could be quite embarrassing. But, yeah, and I lost connection to that energetic side of me. And fitness was, was my way of reconnecting. Yeah, to yeah, that subtle nature of mind, yoga particularly. All right. Now, in Hatha Yoga, meditation is tackled when the energetic anatomy is open, meaning yeah, your bandhas are awake. Yeah, although for some people, bandhas may not um, do as much help yeah, because they're already open energetically, but it helps if you can access the deeper points inside the body. And that's the purpose of the asana and pranayama, for us to yeah, clear the blockages clogging our energetic anatomy. Because when the body is open energetically, you can feel the subtle entity, entity there. And then there are many well manifestations. One um, is like sounds. Yeah, I could fully relate to sound because somebody happened to me while listening to the nada. Back then, I didn't know it was a nada. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like my learning cur curve is backwards. I experienced all of this before I knew about them. And then when I read texts, it's like reading my own yeah, stories. Yeah. I'm not so versed with the technical aspect, the, the jargons of the practice, but I could talk through the experience in a real life sense. How they feel, how they manifest. And I tell you, the, the actual experience is far different from what is depicted in the books. All right, nada sounds. Okay. Nada is like the byproduct of what the energetic forces is uniting inside. And this leads to the, well, the uh, interaction between your um, electrical impulses. And this uh, produces the nada. All right. Nada could also be a byproduct of excess energy, particularly the uh, creative energy, yeah, the sexual energy. Therefore, in Hatha Yoga, the control of sexual energy is vital in preserving the life force because this life force, when we preserve the life force, will cause chemical reactions. We call um, uh, uh, feedback inhibition. You know, when uh, the, the body is brimming with the creative energy, the pituitary gland will yeah, sense that you have enough already and it will yeah, stop producing that particular hormone. And then this hormone that you hold inside the body will transmute into sound, nada. And a nada uh, could be also categorized in various stages, yeah, different sounds. Um, chakras also emit sounds. Yeah, when your bottom regions are open, you will hear like popping sound, yeah, gushing sound, like uh, air pockets yeah, inside the body, like gushing water inside the body. You can feel them, literally you can feel your sacrolumbar region yeah, pulsate. And you can feel the nerve there, like yeah, you're, you're, you are gushing some energetic elements inside the body. Yeah, the core, you can feel the core. Yeah, but the nada that I experienced back then was like the cricket sound, the crickety sound, the sound of like you're alone in the forest, like that. It's not tinnitus, it's not like that. It's, it's there if you listen to it, but it's not there if you're doing your uh, normal activity. 
Yeah. And then that particular instance, yeah, I wasn't doing any yoga asana probably. I was like relaxing then. I could yeah, fully remember I was lying on the bed. I was relaxing. I'm about to take my afternoon nap because after the nap I would be teaching. Then I just entertained my mind listening to the sound of uh, the nada, yeah, the crickety sound. And I got absorbed to this sound. And then it it felt like there was like this lightning sound in the brain, and it it exploded. Yeah, like I could hear the many thousand as as loud, but it's not irritating loud. Yeah, it's it's like something exploded inside my brain, and then from there I could feel just this the energy exit my body. But I I am still. Yeah, into my conscious state. Now, although I was ex- observing it, while I could, yeah, feel literally feel an entity separate from my body. Yeah, and it uh, flew around. It, yeah, yeah really, uh, literally separated. And then the exit font I could fully remember is right here. Yeah, the crown, the crown chakra. And then even the crown chakra. Well, the book says it's the, really the top of the head, the very apex. No, it's towards the forehead, just a little bit above the forehead. Yeah, um, the fontanelle there. Now, now I knew better. Yeah, it's the, the sutures of the spine, the sutures of the skull, I mean. And then there, the, the energy uh, flowing through the brain will just exit that point. And then that's the exit point of the, yeah, the Kundalini. Yeah. And then while the energy is you know, wandering around, you observe it. And you can connect with the other energetic forces. I've experienced that before as a young boy, but it was not um, a beautiful experience back then because it was so intense. Yeah. Um, I dreaded being sick because every time I would yeah, be sick, yeah, I would experience that intense electrical, I say, separation. Now, um, and then that very first experience was intense. It's like I heard this very loud bang inside my brain, and then from there, there's attachment. And then while it's happening, well, because my, my, my mind is fully awake and connected to the breath, or connected to the body, somehow you need to regulate the flow of your breath. Yeah, because the moment you breathe consciously, this consciousness, the spirit will go back inside the body and just resurface to the natural world. So meditation is it's really a combination of the many things. Yeah. Number one, yeah, you need to find a focal point. And then back then my focal point was the nada. Okay. Number two, yeah, you need to have a strong energetic system. Yeah, because as you experience that, you can't just be breathing your normal pace, your normal rhythm. Otherwise you're gonna go back to you know, the normal reality and then you will lose it. So somehow you are, like literally, you know, you're like exploring the dimension of the dead. It's like experiencing dying while you are alive. Yeah, so that's how I describe uh, samadhi. Yeah, it's like you're half dead, half alive. And now that I knew better, because I've, I've experienced samadhi countless of times, yeah, in, in the... In the realm of consciousness, samadhi happens between stages of like consciousness and being less conscious, from less conscious to about you're about to sleep. From about, from that point, you are about to sleep. You are about to dream, yeah. And then from dreaming to the the bliss, and then in between those uh, stages points, those are like samadhis in different stages. There are many levels of samadhi as well. The very memorable one, of us, of course, at first, yeah, and then the the deep the deeper ones. I have like, um, well, the this fleeting or this spirit, this consciousness, get sucked back inside the heart, and I like I entered inside the heart, the void of my heart, like this, like this, you know, um, black hole, like. You get sucked back in, and then inside there's like just the blackness, really, literally blackness, and then you can see like there's a thin line separating 
a white radiance and really a dark abyss, and then you can hear the never sending, never ending om. Even the sound of the om is really different. It's not the om. It's like the om, but the the, the sound is like one. And it's so deep, it's so profound. I've never heard a sound like that before. It's like you're hearing the sound of your own heart, inside the heart. Well, I have a theory, it's, you know, it's the sound of the black hole. Yeah, and then we have many black holes in the body, and then the heart yeah, is the dwelling place of that deep abyss. Yeah, so the heart is really um, a special place. It's, uh, it's a sacred place, yeah. Uh, deeper meditation. I've also experienced meditation that I've heard or I've received information, I received instructions, I received sacral, sacred uh, techniques, yeah, and I've shared that with you, yeah, in the past tutorials, the past talks I have, so you may just want to have a look at that. Uh, mantras have significance, yeah, especially the Soham, and I've, I was given a personal uh, mantra from Adiva, a young a divine personality I've encountered during one of my samadhis. And those, those words have meaning as well. Yeah. Um, so, how can we <laughs> attain that state? Yeah. Now again, looking back, yeah, going backwards. Okay. When we do our meditation, we separate the meditation part the act of meditation from the active observances of asana and pranayama. Yes, you do your asana and pranayama you know, during the day, for example, or you have a program, separate program for that. But when you're doing your meditation, you just do simple uh, physical exercises. Not too intense, because you don't want to be uh, producing too much of the fire. Because again, yeah, now, now that I knew better, meditation is like you are a chemist. You're blending forces inside the body. Too much of that fire, too much of the energy shall render the meditation useless because it, it will burn out the soma inside. The soma being the cerebrospinal fluid. Yeah, if, if the brain is too electrified, then it will not result in deep meditative states. If you're too relaxed, yeah, it will not happen as well. Yeah, soma is like you, you wanted to find that perfect point yeah, for this energetic forces to blend in a way that you're not too uh, stimulated, neither you too relax. Yeah. And um, one technique that I also yeah, engage yeah, is the, of course, uh, stillness. Stillness is very important. All right, your body will itch. Your body, your senses will distract you, will disrupt your practice. All of this external sensation shall pass. And then when the mind is tired already of like, you're moving, yeah, um, giving to the calling of the senses, then you will feel a sense of slight paralysis, like uh, not scary paralysis, but you will feel your skin, you will feel your, the surface of your hand, like little pinching needles, then you meditate upon those sensations. Those sensations are actually your prana exiting yeah, your, your nadis. Yeah, because there's no way but for this prana to leave the body. Yes. So when you have the energy within you, you can't just be holding this energy forever. Somehow it will exit the body. And meditation is a way for us to free our bodies of excess electricity. And this electricity, this energy, if we are able to focus on them while we transition from the different layers of consciousness, that is samadhi. All right. So the body, think about the body like a sponge, okay? You have this energy yeah, you're collecting, yeah. and once the body is already ready to release the excess energy, yeah, this will exit the body in various points. All right. So I'm just stating with you the, the focal points yeah, of your meditation. Yeah, because some people might not be hearing the nada. Yeah, some people might be sensitive with the electrical pulsation running through their body. Yeah, and people who practice yoga nidra, yeah, this is very common. Like uh, your skin 
will crawl. Yeah, you can feel them like electricity exiting your your fingertips. You focus on them. Uh, these sensations could also lead to absorption. I've experienced that as well. All right, what else? Um, uh, of course, uh, stillness and silence. Yeah, silence. You can't just be meditating uh, in a very crowded space. Yeah, because somehow you need to find that that sanctity of your practice. Silence, stillness, and you have to have a conducive space for practice. All right. Every time I do my meditation, I will cover my my head up to my eyes, yeah, and to help me attain a relaxed state of uh, optic. Uh, functions and then the head would have to remain uh, warm as well so that's also what I realized when the head is warm comfortably warm you can easily magnetize yeah, the CSF flowing there yeah warmth help cover your body as well all right cover your body so you keep the energy within so when uh, you are not allowing ec or unnecessary energy to touch your skin so that's that's the essence because if the air is blowing your skin, it will not happen as well. Because you're too, well, I say, uh, distracted with the superficial. So as much as possible, keep your body yeah, less exposed to what? Uh, uh, too much heat or uh, air or wind as well as cold. Yeah. Um, I also like felt like if I am wearing cotton yeah it's more uh, i say suited for meditation yeah cotton so something which is comfortable and your your body yeah can the, well the the energy can easily like exit the body when you're you're uh, wearing cotton yeah cotton and loose loose clothing now you can't be wearing tights you can't be wearing for example jeans yeah, when you do your meditation, you have to yeah wear something comfortable, loose, and cotton. Yeah, yes. So uh, those those are my observation really. Yeah. Lately, I've been well doing other techniques as well because um, you're, you're, there's this theory of mine that yeah, it, meditation is also like experiencing diminish, diminishing returns. The more you have it, the less you experience it. Yeah. And then the more you experience it, the more you will realize ways of attaining it. All right. Like, for example, now, the nada, yes, is there, but when I listen to the nada, it's like I'm, I'm past that stage. I have to focus my mind to something which is uh, deeper. Right. And at this stage of my practice, um, I do some uh, sounds. Yeah, I produce the sound as well. Yeah, I would sometimes hum, I would sometimes chant uh, the Om. No. Om. Om. When you do that, you initiate yeah, the, the, the sacred vibration inside. Like your, your mind, your brain becomes so used to the sound, then eventually, yeah, when you lose it, then you will lose it, just chant it, and then you will just lose track and just absorbed through, you get absorbed to this sound internally, then it also can absorb the mind. Okay. Now, so the stage of meditation is like separate your uh, conscious techniques to your meditation. All right. But you still have to open the body. Okay. After opening the body, I will just do like reclining stretches side to side. I, I don't even flow. Sometimes I will just stand up and I will just sway the body like, yeah, like this. Yeah, I could like, <laughs> yeah, like standing. I could just circle around like that, swing the shoulder, yeah, do some reclining, swinging. Yeah, all the, the classes I teach and I share with you, they all come from personal experience and I do them myself. Then I will lie down. Yeah, most of my samadhi happens in the shavasana, with the head elevated. Yeah, and yeah, you know, most of the time it will drift me to sleep because I meditate at night. Um, but 
there are times and even 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 the time of the month yeah i could feel when it's about to happen yeah. i could feel the energy is there brimming so it's like it's time yes yeah, so i do my meditation and then yeah it happens good yes so there's there's really no right and wrong way of doing meditation meditation because i as i've mentioned everyone's gifted with different energetic faculties potentials yeah but what happened to me yeah is somehow close to the practices of hatha yoga because even if you read hatha yoga pradipika this talk yeah real resonant as well sounds um sensations as well as the utilization of optical muscles yes he is speaking of optical muscles if you try to just let your eyes drift like you're blurring the eyes inside the brain yeah and then you feel this magnetizing sensation there like you're sol solving a puzzle while you're lying down yeah it could yeah stimulate it could absorb your optical function and the the, the eyes you know, the eyes are very powerful and i experienced that as well like while observing that like a pinch or a, a tiny radiance entered this part of my 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 brain inside and i got absorbed all right um brahmari pranayama <laughs> yeah the one yeah I, i do that too like <laughs> I will sound and hum the inhalation, yeah, the Brahmari Pranayama. Yeah, it uh, also led me to a few samadhis. Yeah. But, but the, deeper, the deeper ones happen when I least expect them to happen. And there are times of the day that I am more uh, aligned and close to samadhi. Yeah, you know, those intersections of the evening, the afternoon, early afternoon, or towards the early or the latter evenings, yeah, of the day and night, yeah, in the morning, early in the morning. So I think, well, even if you read books about yoga, there are like times of the day where we are energetically open, and you just have to seize those out. Or opportunity the windows the energetic windows the sacred windows and i've talked about all of this in, on this channel i think i've i've given if if i'm going to be summarizing the lessons i've shared with you i i i could have probably written yeah an entire collection and yeah more than enough to lie, last this lifetime all right so um yeah hope this talk helped you well have some more information you might be able to resonate already yeah thank you and have a lovely day namaste